My goal on this talk is to convince you that this is not Moon Math. This is also development. Uh, this is also tooling for developers. So today I'm going to present Socrates. Uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to what it is for those of you who don't know it, um, and then I will present a few things that we've been working on and that I'm excited to share. So what is Socrates? If you want to program Snarks today, there's different tools that you can use. Maybe some of you have heard of Socrates. And all those tools have different trade-offs in terms of power that they give to developers and how easy they are to use and how high level or low level they are. Socrates uh, has a positioning as a very high level language. So when you write Socrates, it looks very similar to if you were writing Rust or Python or something like that. It compiles to R1CS. So this is uh, the kind of snarks that are easy to verify today on Ethereum. So you can verified directly in your smart contracts. It uses modular backend implementations, which means that Zocrates does not develop a proof system itself, but rather uses backend implementations from the community for different proof systems um, and just targets that and uh, uses those great implementations. Um, in order to have such a high level language, um, but still have something that's really efficient at the, at the low level, uh, Zocrates makes use of uh, optimizations in the compiler, which is something that's also different from some other tools which give you a very low level access to what's going on on the constraint level, uh, but don't really apply a lot of optimizations. Um, so where does it run? So the part of Zocrates uh, which allows you to compile, so the compiler, uh, you can run it natively on your machine. We have a Remix plugin as well. And we also now have uh, a playground that you can access at play.zocrit.es, which I encourage you to, to start. That's probably the easiest way to get started with Zocrates and just write some simple programs. Um, in terms of the scheme, so those backend implementations that we support, we currently have support for Graph 16, which is, uh, some of you may know, the, the, the snark that is the smallest uh, and the fastest to verify. For GM17, which is an, uh, an evolution of Graph16, let's say, for Marlin, which is a, a universal snark, uh, which I'll touch on a bit later, and for Nova, which I'll also go into, which is a new type of exciting snark that enables new use cases. Um, for proving, so the particular implementations, we rely on Bellman, Arc, Bellperson, and also snark.js. Um, I'll also go into a bit more detail on, on, on that integration. And in terms of the verifier, we have, uh, you can verify in JavaScript or in the, in the CLI. And for some of the schemes that are compatible with uh, the EVM, we generate a verifier contract so that you can directly send your proofs to your smart contracts and verify them and, and link them to your DAP. So to give a bit of a hello world of, uh, of Zocrates, here's um, a, a program which takes two private inputs, A and B, and one public input C, and then asserts that A times B is equals to C. So technically, this is a program where, with which you can prove that you know the factorization of a number. Um, the way you would run that is you would first compile that program, which would turn it into this low-level representation uh, that's, let's say, R1CS. Then you could execute that program with an input here, 3, 3, and 9. Then you could generate a proof using a particular uh, proof system. And you could also generate a verifier that you can then deploy on the EVM and then send your proof to and then convince, basically convince the network that you actually knew this factorization. For an example of something that's a little bit more advanced uh, to make the point that this is actually a high level language, um, here's the implementation in Zocrates of the SHA-256 function. So just to give you a few things that are expected in a high-level language, we have a module import system. You can import constants as well. Um, we have for loops, of course. We have function calls. And also one exciting thing that we added kind of recently, and maybe some of you who use Rust are familiar with that feature, is the notion of uh, constant generics. Uh, so in this case, the SHA-256 function uh, is a hash function that can take an arbitrary number of bytes as input. 
However, in circuits, all the inputs are always static. So all of these, uh, the size of the input will always have to be known at uh, compile time. But this is something that we do. You can still define this uh, as something that is generic over k, and then have a number of rounds of this SHA round function. But then when you compile your program and actually use the function, the SHA256, um, this, um, this variable k is going to have a concrete value, uh, which will then compile to the exact number of blocks that you're hashing. And if you're trying to do something that's dyna dynamic, uh, calling this function on uh, something that's not, whose um, size is not known at compile time, it's just going to fail at compile time. So we can have a very idiomatic implementation of SHA256. Of course, there's more complexity in a SHA round. Um, but if you look at the code, uh, it's almost line to line equivalent to uh, an implementation that you would see on Wikipedia, for example, a pseudocode implementation. Now I'm going to go a bit, in a bit more detail on a, a detail of the SHA-256 implementation. So inside the SHA round, this expression needs to be calculated a lot of times. It basically takes three um, unsigned integers, A, B, and C, of 32 bits, and uh, calculates A and B, XOR, A and C, XOR, B and C. And this is something that you can just write like this in Socrates today, compile, and it will translate that to a number of constraints at the low level. However, if um, you do the math and look at, um, the, let's say, the first bit of A, the first bit of B, and the first bit of C, uh, you can see that if you consider them as numbers, so as field elements, they actually verify, so the result actually verifies those two equations. So you define or you constrain a new variable bc to be equals to, equal to b times c. And here, I just want to clarify that these constraints are the low-level constraints that we deal with. So the R1CN constraints, they look like this. They have one sign, which is linear. So in, in this case, it's only one variable, but you can have a sum of different variables. One side, which is quadratic, right? So this first one uh, just defines bc, or like constrains a new variable bc to be equal to b times c. And then uh, introduces this res variable here, uh, which is our result for the first bit, um, and then constrains it in this way. And this is actually more efficient than what the compiler would generate itself, because here we have uh, more knowledge of what we're actually trying to do than the compiler does. On the flip side, here, what we're doing is that we're introducing a new variable res and then constraining it with this, uh, with this equation. However, when you're dealing with the, such low-level details in Snarks, it's really easy to introduce new variables but fail to constrain them sufficiently so that you actually introduce uh, vulnerabilities in your circuits. So this is something that Zocrates does not expose at the moment to the developer, which means that you can only do this one, which is less efficient. If you look at more lower level tools, they let you use these things, but then it's at your own risk. And then it's likely that you're going to introduce uh, vulnerabilities. So what I want to showcase today is uh, the addition to Zocrates, a way to actually encode this thing and have um, the performance from this thing in the context of the higher level language. Yeah, so I have a video now, if you could start the video. All right, so this is using the, actually the Socrates um, playground. So here I defined the default function, which I call the default function, where I just, I'll just use the compiler uh, uh, to uh, generate the constraints for this, uh, this expression. Um, here, I'm going to create an, uh, an entry point for this program. Uh, so taking also A, B, and C, returning a U32. And I'm just going to call the default function and see how many constraints uh, are created in the process. So I compile, and then I get the result, 260 constraints here. And now what I'm going to do is to define another version of this function, which hopefully will reduce the number of constraints by leveraging uh, this lower level implementation. So I call it hand optimized, has the same signature, A, B, and C, also return a U32. As I described earlier, I want to operate on each individual bit 
of this U32. So the first thing I'm going to do is turning this U32 into uh, an array of Booleans. We have sort of a magic tool in our standard library to do that, which is called a cast function, um, and which can do this conversion for you. And here I want to point out that this is actually free, um, because the U32 type is actually represented as 32 bits um, under the hood. So we're not paying any constraints for this. So I just cast the three of them. The next thing I'm going to do is introduce a new um, array of Booleans for the result. Here, one relatively new feature we have is that everything is immutable by default. So here, I have to declare this variable mutable if I want to be able to modify it after. OK. So now that I have all the bits, I can start a for loop. So for i from 0 to 32, and here I'm going to consider the i-th bit of a, b, and c. And if we want to have access to those, uh, those low-level constraints, um, we need to reason at the level of field elements. So we need to turn those Booleans into field elements, which is a lower-level um, representation. For this, I call this bool to field um, function, which I'm going to define in a second. I do the same for B and C. And here, I'm going to define this function. And again, this is something that's going to be free. It's not going to create any constraints for the same reason as earlier, because a Boolean is actually represented as a field element at the low level. It's just that it can only be the value 0 for false and 1 for true. So I can just return that using a ternary expression. OK. So now I have A, B, C as, uh, as field elements. Now I have this first constraint, which was uh, B, C equals um, B times C. And actually, this constraint I can already define in, in the high-level language, because I'm doing both constraining and assigning BC. So I do that. So I have that first constraint is done. Then I declare this uh, result, all, again, mutable. And this is where the interesting new thing happens. I have this assembly block that I can uh, create. And here I have, I have access to sp a, two special kinds of um, uh, statements. The first one is going to be just an assignment. So I introduce, I just assign the value bc minus this other expression to res, but it did not create any constraints. It's purely just an assignment. So this has no influence on the constraint system. And then I want to be able to use this, um, this res value later, but to use it, I need to make sure that it's really constrained in the constraint system. So after this, assi this uh, assignment, I add actually constraint, which, um, which makes sure that everything is, uh, is set in stone. So here, bc minus res equals this multiplication. You can see that, again, this can be any expression here when I assign, but this has to be linear equals quadratic. Right? So here. This is, this is working. OK, so now I have everything set up. Um, and I'm convinced that res has a result that I need. The next thing that I want to do is that I actually want to have a Boolean. I'm going to go the other way around and reconstruct my result. But I, I want to have a Boolean. And I want to go from a field element to a Boolean. And here, I want to make it really clear that this is an, an unsafe, a potentially unsafe operation, because this res value, I know that it's 0 or 1 because I, I wrote this. But in theory, it could be any value. So I need to be really careful when I do this. Um, but I can force uh, the creation of this Boolean with this value. Finally, I reconstruct the U32 value from the Boolean uh, array using this cast function again. 
Okay, and I changed my entry point to use the hand optimized version. So we were at 260, and now we're at 164. Um, so we made uh, quite, quite a big uh, dent in, in our constraint count. So what's the idea here? Um, we want to keep all the guarantees that we have from our higher level language. We have types, we have things. We know that Booleans can be only 0, 1 if you don't write assembly blocks. But at the same time, we want to have access to this low level thing. And here, I think there's actually a parallel with Rust in a way, which says, OK, we, we have a compiler that's like really strict for all these things, but we still want to be able to do all these lower level things. We want to disable a bunch of checks. And we have a similar approach where, as a developer, you would write most of your program in safe Zocrates, let's say. Uh, but then for the few parts that need the extra performance, you can write them in those uh, ASM blocks and try to make those blocks as small as possible so that when you need to review the code or make sure that things are not unconstrained, you know exactly where to look at, and these things are rel relatively sp small. Um, one side effect of this, also for us as a compiler team, is that we can use this ourselves to reduce the complexity of the compiler. This particular um, operation in the SHA-256 uh, algorithm, we, in the compiler, we have a special case which detects whenever we're doing this and uses this exact constraints. But now, potentially using assembly blocks, what we can do is rewriting um, some of the internals of the compiler to actually use these things which then reduce the size of the compiler code base and makes it easier to reason about and audit. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about, which is uh, unrelated to this, uh, is the fact that Zocrates is not compatible with, with uh, Snark.js. So Snark.js is a JavaScript library for Snarks from um, the IDEN3 team, from the Circum team, um, which has a bunch of tools allowing you to work with Snarks in a JavaScript context. What we have now available today is uh, if you start from your, your Zocrates program and you run the compilation, currently um, it returns an output which is the low-level Zocrates representation. But you can also optionally return an .r1cs file, which is um, <coughs> the format that is accepted by um, Snark.js. And then if you want to execute your program, you take uh, your input, and, uh, and the program itself, and you can create uh, a witness file, which is also compatible with, with uh, Snark.js. And from this point on, you're in Snark.js land, so you can do whatever Snark.js enables you to do, uh, using different proof systems, uh, using a powers of tau ceremony, um, uh, and run your verifier in the browser, et cetera, et cetera. So any tooling that's compatible with these formats can now be used with Zocrates as well. Another topic that I wanted to touch on um, quickly is the is incrementally, incrementally verifiable computation. So this is a scary word, but it's basically the idea that if you have a computation which you can split in steps, which are basically the same function being run over and over again on the, sa on, on the state and updating the state, um, then you can actually use recursive snarks to prove this computation incrementally. So as opposed to Zocrates currently to, to other proof systems where you can think of them as more like an ASIC, so your circuit is like this ASIC that's really set in stone and you can do only one computation and everything is bounded and static. In this case, you can have a computation where you run uh, one round of the computation and then another one later and you can um, prove the, execu the execution of that computation at each step. So some use cases for that are uh, succinctly verifiable blockchains. So maybe some of you have heard of uh, the MENA blockchain, where basically you use this to have uh, a, a, a blockchain where um, each time you get a new block, you, you verify the previous block as well as the transaction of this block, and then it creates a snark. And then you have this kind of recursive verification. Another uh, use case is uh, VDFs, because some of the VDFs actually have the structure of having uh, some state which is then to which you um, apply a function recursively. And then uh, being able to have a snark of these computation can be really, really useful. So what we're working on now, and we're actually pretty close to having this ready in production, uh, is uh, integrating a um, 
proof system called Nova, um, which does exactly this. And the way that I, I'm not going to go too much in detail here, but the way that the API would work for developers today is that you write a function, and the only um, restriction here is that the input needs to be the, the input type needs to be the output type because you want the recursive aspect to to work. And then you can compile this function to a specific curve. So you need to use this palace curve because under the hood, Nova uses uh, cycles of elliptic curves. So this doesn't work for any curve, but we support the curves that enable that. And then you can basically prove a number of steps starting from uh, a, given, a given state. And even after running this, you could run it again starting from the last state that you had. So this, hope, this opens a lot of use cases for people who want to, uh, to experiment with um, incrementable, uh, incremental verifiable computation. So I invite you to, to test that. It's, it's going to be out very soon. OK, um, since I only have two minutes left, I'll just go very quickly uh, through some things that we, that we added recently. So there's the powers of tau ceremony. So if you look at Gross 16, for example, it's, uh, it requires a trusted setup. Uh, and the powers of tau ceremony uh, enables you to do that using MPC. So you can do that directly with the Zorkitis CLI, and also in, the, in Zorkitis JS, actually. We also have support for log statements uh, that you can, uh, where you can inspect uh, certain values of your code at runtime. We have support for the Marlin proof system that I mentioned earlier, which is a universal setup, which means that you can do one setup and then use it for different circuits. We also changed a lot of the syntax uh, following some feedback from, from uh, members of the community. And finally, yeah, the, this, this um, playground, which is now accessible which I invite you to, to check out. OK, I think that's, that's all I had to share. Uh, so thanks for listening. If there's any questions, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Um, can we use the new Nova support to write um, another but shorter ZK EVM? I think in theory, yes. I'm not sure it would be the most efficient. Uh, but there were already, actually a long time ago, VMs that were built on top of recursive snarks. Um, but they were using recursion at each cycle of the CPU, which was quite inefficient. But maybe there's a new take that could be that you can have on, on that. So that would be one cycle for each opcode? Or... That, that's, that was the case in those uh, projects 10 years ago. It's a project called TinyRAM, where that's what they did. They basically took the state of the CPU and just ran each time one, one opcode and then have a recursive snark uh, recursive snark each time but there's, there, maybe there's other approaches to uh, leverage this proof system so instead of making users to write very optimized code have, have you put effort on kind of making the compiler, compiler kind of figure out what the user wants and then optimize the circuit based on that so are you saying that okay is your question that we should, instead of having low-level code, have the, have the compiler detect when it can do this, those optimizations, right? Uh, I mean both, but like, you were only talking about the other case. Right. So this is something that, as I mentioned, this is something that we do currently, where we identify some of those use cases, I mean some of those cases, and just have them in the compiler. Um, but it's just really hard to cover them, cover them all because it's really use case dependent. Uh, here, this is just for one part of the SHA-256 function, but there's so many different things that you could optimize. Um, so I think it's actually a good idea to open that to developers, but in a way that that's quite separated from the rest of the high-level code.